Paul writing here, he says, for do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if yet I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my con conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I, I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the, the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I, I lie not. Afterward, I, I came into the regions of Syria and, and Cilicia and, and was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which he once destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Lord, how wonderful, Lord, just to read about, Lord, just the, this testimony of grace, of your, your power, Lord, the power of the gospel to to change a life, Lord, to transform, Lord, somebody that was so against you and fighting you. And then here he is, this apostle of grace to the Gentiles. And here we are today, Lord. And we think about, Lord, just the testimony of grace in our own lives and how you saved us, how you loved us, Lord. And Lord, it was, it was your good pleasure, Lord, to, to call us by your grace, to reveal your son in us, Lord. And Lord, we want to we want to keep drawing near to you and allow you to move in our lives. And Lord, if there's anybody here today or listening or watching, and Lord, they don't know you, that today would be the day that they come to you, Lord. We believe you want to move by your Spirit today, and so we give this time to you in Jesus' name, Amen. I titled the message in chapter one here as we finish this chapter, "Called by Grace." You know, you you read the Bible. And, and you, in the New Testament, we, we read about this man, Paul, and there's no question that when you look at Paul's life, he lived his life with passion. He, he wasn't the kind of guy that was half-hearted in anything that he did. We would look at Paul and we say, he was all in. That guy was just 100% all in in whatever he did. Before he knew the Lord, he, was, he had a passion, didn't he? He was a Pharisee, and he wasn't just a Pharisee. He was, you know, a passionate, more zealous than my equals, right, as we read through the text right there. He, he describes himself as zealous of the law in Philippians chapter 3, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like, he, he knew the tribe that he came from. He had his heritage, the pedigree, and yet you look at his life, and he would say in Philippians chapter Chapter 3, that everything that was gained to him, everything that was valuable, everything that, that, that he identified in, that he was so passionate about, that he counted it loss, worthless. And you think, what happens? What happens in someone's life where you think they're going so hard and moving in this direction and so unlikely to come to the Lord? Why this transformation? How did it happen? Well, in one word, we, we might say grace. That could be one way to say it. We could also say Jesus. <laughs> But, but Paul, Paul encountered the gospel of grace. He encountered Jesus Christ and his life was changed. And so much so that he says, everything else, look, go read Philippians chapter three, verse, or chapter four, verse seven and eight. Everything else was worthless, he says, when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ, of knowing him, of knowing Jesus. It all, it's, it doesn't, it's, 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 it's rubbish, it's worthless. And that message of grace, that same message that so impacted and transformed his own life, that's what Paul preached when he went out and shared the gospel. 
And when he came to, to we, we read about this, this book called Galatians. These were real people, real cities. That It's a region, Galatia, and these cities of Derby and, and, you know, Iconium and Lystra. And you're like, I have no clue where they are. Get one of those Bible maps in the back right here or like, you know, Google it after. But those are historic cities and places in what would be modern day Turkey as we, we look at the map today. But Paul labored in the gospel because he wanted to bring to them that life-changing message, the good news of the grace of God that there is a righteousness, there's a way to be right with God, that that isn't through the law, it isn't through works, it's a righteousness that comes by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And that you can be forgiven, that you can be saved, and that you can be set free, that we can be justified. We, we talked about that bi big fancy Bible word that God looks at you and me, justified, never sin, and it's by faith. Last week we said it's Jesus plus nothing. It isn't Jesus in our works or Jesus in our human effort or anything like that. And that message that Paul proclaimed in Galatia, and then he would go on from, from city to city and town to town and place to place, that message changed people's lives. That message turned the world upside down and brought life and hope and freedom to the Galatians. And so Paul, after he moves on and, and is no longer in Galatia, he, why he's writing this letter, we need to know why, is that these false teachers had come in. We, we call them Judaizers or legalists because they, they came from a Jewish background and they came in with a different message and, and, and not the message of grace. And it wasn't different in the sense of like, you know, they just thought, hey, some people wear jeans, some people wear suits. It's, you know, preference, potato, potato kind of a thing. Not, 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 not a preference. It wasn't a style or, or something minor. It was another gospel, he said at, the, at, at verse 8 and 9 last week as we read it. It, it was another gospel. A gospel that, that included your works. Oh yeah, believe in Jesus, but also your human effort. And so, yeah, you, you gotta put your faith in Christ the Messiah, but you also need to become, and this is what they were doing, you need to become a Jew. You need to convert over and, and follow the, the, the traditions of the fathers, the customs of the law, all, all, of, all of these things, the feast, the dietary law. And, and, and apparently this was a big issue, man. You guys gotta get circumcised, Gentiles, if you haven't been. And this was, this was a very you know, contentious point. Actually, Paul was really upset about that. We're going to read about it. He's like, I wish you guys were cut off. And you know what he's talking about there. He took it pretty seriously. And then even to grow, to mature in the Lord, it's about your works and what you do. And, and, and so here, and, and listen, that, that happens. You know, nobody's telling, sometimes, you know, we look at this and we want to separate ourselves from it and get like, glad they're not trying to bring me under the dietary laws. But, but the, the legalist today, it's, it's follow my program. And you have to follow these steps. And if you do these things, and, 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 and it can be good things, you better read the Bible at this time of day and for this many minutes. And if you do these things, then man, God's really gonna, oh, he's gonna love you more and bless you more. And, and, and it becomes a relationship that's based on works. Instead of, it's, it's not, oh, I have to do these things to be accepted by God. It's, I'm accepted. I'm accepted because of his grace, because of what he did on the cross. And now anything we do, yeah, I want to read my Bible. Yeah, I want to pray. Yeah, I want to share Jesus with people. But it's a response to his grace. It's not to earn any favor from the Lord. And so Paul, when he heard about these things and these false teachers coming in, he wrote this letter. And, and what they were doing, they were accusing Paul that basically Paul, he's a man pleaser. Paul just cares about, you know, uh, pleasing people. And so when he came, he didn't really tell you the hard stuff. You know, he didn't tell you the real deal because, you know, he doesn't really have authority. He's not a real apostle. And kind of this message, he doesn't have the message that we have. We're real Jews. Man, we really know the Old Testament and the Messiah. And, and you got, you know, we have this deeper knowledge. And so Paul, he hears about this perversion of the gospel of grace and he writes this letter to defend it. And, and, and he's so bold as we ended last time. He says, if anybody preaches any other gospel than that we preach, you know, if an angel, right, from heaven, we, anybody preaches this, he says, let them be accursed. You know, he, he's bold about that, right? This message, and, and, and what he's going to tell them as we go in the text this time, this message, you know, is, oh, well, well, what makes your gospel so special? Well, he's saying it's not, it's not that it, it's from man or from me or anybody else. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's his gospel. It came from him. It's about him. It has everything to do with him. 
right? It, it's not something that came from man. It came from God. And he's going to tell his story about how, this, how, how, how the gospel came to him, how he found grace. Or maybe it'd be better to say how grace found him. You know, we're like, man, I found the Lord. And he's like, yeah, that's true. But, you know, he found you. <laughs> and, he, you know, we, we realize, Lord, you had, a, you had a plan all this time. And you look back and you see, man, God, you were moving in my life, bringing me to this place. And, and here I am. And we, we receive his grace. And, and, and really, I, I love that in verse 15, how God's heart is to call people by his grace. Right? To know him, to know Jesus, as it goes on to say there. So Paul, in verse 10, he says, Fear for now do I persuade men... Or God, do I speak to please men? For if yet I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. See, Paul, when, when Paul's preaching this gospel of grace, Paul is not, Paul, Paul isn't like, you know, I'm going out here because I just want to make people happy. No, Paul cares about people being holy. <laughs> he cares about people being right with God. People that are away from God coming into a relationship with God. Paul didn't come in like some people do and, and run a, a, a demographic survey and find out what, what, are, you know, what are they going through in Galatia? You know, what are the felt needs there? And uh, what, what do you think you need? What do you, I think I need? We don't even know what we need. And we're so loud, oh, I think I need this and I think I need that. You know, and, hey, he didn't do, do some poll or survey to kind of, you know, you know, find something that now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell these people some message they can tickle their ears. You know, and, and uh, that wasn't Paul. He said, I'm not a man pleaser. His aim, his heart was to please God. And I think about that. I think about how, how, how important that is, that our heart would be to please God and to seek first his kingdom. Because what Paul's going to say here is you can't, you can't really do both. Right? Isn't, isn't it Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6? Where he says, you cannot serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. You'll either love one or you'll either hate one and love the other or, or you'll hold to the one and despise the other. You, and you can't serve God and mammon, right? And he's talking there about, you know, wealth. Like you, you can't serve God and, and, and your money and your wealth. That was a God that people served. And, and, he, and then he tells us, you know, hey, God's gonna take care of you. He's gonna provide for you. And, and then he says in verse 36 there to seek, or 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And, and Paul lived that life. He said, I'm not, I'm not trying to serve two masters. I'm not trying to serve the master of pleasing people. I wanna live and seek God's kingdom and to stand before him. And that was in Paul's mind that one day I'm gonna stand before God and give an account of my life before the Lord. And I, I wanna hear well done, good and faithful servant. So he lived his life that way. And I think what a challenge, what an exhortation to say, Lord, how am I living my life? Am I living my life for self or am I living it for you? Am I living it for other people and their expectations or am I living for you? What, what am I seeking there? And the false teachers, they, they were seeking to please people. There, there's a contrast between his life and these false teachers. But, but you can't be the servant of Christ if you're going to seek to please man. That's what Paul is saying there. And you know, there's an entire religious system today, many of the religions in the world, even in Christian circles today, where they live to please men. Where, 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 where they say, hey, we're speaking for Jesus, and yet they, they don't want to please God because they don't want to speak the truth of God's word. They just want to make people happy, and so they won't speak up about topics that are unpopular or maybe go against the cultural vein and the cultural thinking of things. Right? So we're not going to talk about the truth of God's word and address the issues and call things sin that are sin that the Bible says, but we're going to be quick to update our social media for whatever you know the latest whim is. Oh, people got to know I'm not for that and I'm against that. As long as I want to be for whatever you know, makes people happy. And Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't tossed back and forth with those things because Paul didn't live in the fear of man. It says in the Proverbs, we're studying Proverbs on Wednesday night, the fear of man is a snare. It's gonna trap you. Right? But the fear of the Lord, man, the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom. Right? You, you wanna say, man, I want my life to be ordered and I, I want God's wisdom, right? Begin to fear the Lord and care about what he thinks of your life. And that's, what Paul, that's how Paul lived. And, and he says, I, I recognize this, I can't be a faithful servant of Jesus Christ and be a man pleaser. Because you know what? When you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know what's going to happen? It's life-changing. It's powerful. It's, it's, it's able to convert the soul. But listen, when you preach the gospel, you're going to preach the cross. And the cross of Christ is an offense. Listen, not just to other people, it offends me. 
right? What Jesus says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. You mean I gotta, I gotta, I gotta put this old man on the cross? I gotta die to self and what I want? I, I, that, that offends me because I don't want to do that. My flesh doesn't, have, there's that battle. We'll get to it in chapter five here between, you know, the, the flesh and the spirit. They're contrary to one another, right? But what do we do? It's through the spirit that, that we do put to death. We mortify the deeds of the flesh. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lesser of. There's a message of the cross that I preach to myself every single day. And when we share that, you know what? It's an offense. It's a stumbling block, but yet it is the wisdom and the power of God because it's the only way of salvation, There's salvation in no other apart from Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross. It's the message that, you know, we'll we'll look at in verse 15 and 16. It pleased God. Yeah, yeah, it's going to offend. It's the truth. But sometimes we need to be offended. We live in such a world where we're afraid of offending people. Are you going to know? What if they don't like me? Now listen, are are we going to please God? Are we going to worry about what the world thinks? Because you know what pleases God? It pleased God to separate Paul from his mother's room. It pleased God to call him by his grace. It pleased God to reveal his son in, in, in Paul and in you. And God's heart is to reveal his son in other people's lives. And God wants to use us to bring that, the message of the gospel and hope and to call people by his grace. So Paul, Paul's saying here, I'm, I'm not trying to please man, but I certify to you in verse 11 that the gospel which was preached of me, like this message that Paul proclaimed, it's not after man. For neither I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, uh, but by re- revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right, so, so we say, where did this gospel come from? Where did Paul come up with this message of grace? Did, and a lot of people, they say, oh, this is, you know, Paul, he's the kind of the, you know, the, the, the forerunner of, he's saying, it wasn't me. I didn't make this up. It wasn't a message that that's after man. It isn't man-made. Its origin, as he says here, it's divine. It came by the revelation of Jesus Christ, that this unveiling. There, there's an unveiling. You know, it, it, it's so funny. John talks about the love of God being manifested, being revealed toward us. Because why? God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Right, Jesus, he's the revelation of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, this is of divine origin. But this gospel of works that the Judaizers and legalists were preaching, that's a gospel of man. That came from man. And every religion of man, it's basically the same. It's man trying to do better and to do good, to, to reach God. And, and the problem is, is we, we're, we can't be good enough. We all fall short. We can't even keep up to our own standards. But the gospel of grace is that God came down and God sent his son because he loved this world and he wanted to save this world. He's not willing that any should perish. And this gospel is a message from God. You, you have this, again, let's go back to, maybe you don't have this in your hand like a book, but maybe you got your like tablet or something in there and it's, it's on, the, on the page. I don't care as long as you read the Bible, you know. Just, just read it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. What we have, the Bible, this message, this this. It's not just the good book. You know, people say, oh man, you know, oh, it's the good book. And, and by the way, I, I like, there's a reason I like an actual paper Bible. I, I use my phone Bible or iPad Bible all the time. I have no problem with that. But you go into Starbucks, nobody's offended, you know, by this. You sitting there, right? Nobody's like, oh man, you throw this thing out on a table like that. And they're like, is that a Bible? Like, what they got a Bible in here for? And, the, and you know, let, you watch God open doors, you put one of these on the table at Starbucks or Tim Hortons or wherever. You know what I'm saying? Like, just word of advice right there. You know, you want, want to be a light, you know, and, and that, that's, that's going to do that. But look at this book, people, oh, it's the good book. Like, like it's just some piece of literature. And that, oh, yeah, yeah, that's got some great, you know, values in it and a good moral guide. But the real question is, is, is this message from God? Is this something divine that came from heaven to earth, that this is God-breathed, that, that's not after man is what Paul is saying here? It, it, did it come by revelation of Jesus Christ? It, or, or is it a human invention? Is it something that people got together and they, you know, let's start this new branch of, you know, we're going to make it in, in, in how we think this would be better than what came before. And so they got, is, is, it, is it an invention of men getting together and coming up with this? Or is it something that came from God? Well, what Paul is saying, what the word of God says is, no, this, this is God breathed. This came from heaven. So it's one or the other. 
It's either true that it came from God or it's man-made. And if it's man-made, it came from man. This, this, isn't, <laughs> this is worthless. It's not true. It's a lie. But if it came from God and from heaven, then nothing is more important. And we can know, we can know this book, the message that we have from God, that, that it's not just some ancient document. You know, but, 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 but you look and God, because God in his wisdom, right, he's given us his word that this is the most reliable ancient document that we have available to us as it relates to history, as it relates to everything that it talks about. You know, God, God made his word known to us and he's able to preserve his word. It's accurate, it's reliable, it's trustworthy. You read through the Bible, it's not once upon a time. It's not fairy tales. It's not a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. There were the Naboo people. And it's like, you know, that's Star Wars, man. And that's even the lame one, you know? So like, come on, you know what I'm talking about. So you, you Star Wars nerds, you get that, right? And, and, and here's the thing, right? This is real people. Confirmed by the archaeologists and their spade digging in the dirt over there. All right, you, you, the real places, you know, people used to, used to, I could say, but also still do, mock the Bible because the Bible will speak about places and civilizations and, and, and people that have been lost to history and they go, come on. And for years they would say, the Hittites, come on. We, we don't have any record of the Hittite people. And they keep digging over there. I mean, they, they, everywhere is an archaeological site in Israel. It's incredible when you go over there. And as they, they're digging and they discover, and what did they find out? They discovered the Hittite civilization that for years and years people mocked and said, well, that, the Bible's not true. We don't know about these people. And then they discover them. See, this book, 66 books by 40 different authors written on three different continents uh, uh, in uh, three different languages over a period of 1,600 years, right, by people of, of different social, political, economic status and all of those things right there. And yet, as, as you read through it, it, it addresses the most controversial topics known to man, eternal life, our origins, our destiny. It speaks on morality and ethics, all of these things the Bible talks about, and there's a harmony to it. It's unified like no other book could. We couldn't get 40 of us together and do that. I mean, let alone spacing it over time and generations and languages, right? The Bible is unique because the author is God, and God is eternal, and God's outside of time. And God also, in this book, tells us, things that are going to happen before they happen. It's called prophecy. There's over 300 prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ. And people look at them and they go, well, this some of these things had to be written after the fact. There have to be two Isaiahs because there's no way that Isaiah could talk about these things. He, he wouldn't have known about that. And then they uncover, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and they find out, oh no, well, this is, <laughs> it's the same guy. And you go and you look at those manuscripts and it's exactly the word of God that we have today. God's preserved his word. And he's foretold what happened and what's going to happen. And that message of hope of the gospel we can rely upon and that, that's the gospel that changed Paul's life, that changed their life. And he's saying, this didn't, I, I didn't get this from man in verse 12. Some man didn't come up with this. It's not where it came. I didn't, I didn't teach this and I, I went to, you know, I got some education and I, I learned this. No, it was by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I think what's so unique about Paul is that most of us, when we got saved, somebody, there, there was a person that very likely shared the gospel from you. Maybe at church, there was a pastor or a preacher or you were at an event or, or maybe it was in somebody's kitchen. It was a mom or a dad or a friend at work and there was a person that shared the gospel with you, right? Well, it's interesting. There was, no, there was none of that for Paul. There wasn't like an apostle that was like, stop, Paul, halt, you know, heareth the gospel. They must have talked in King James, I'm guessing. No, right, you know, it's like that didn't happen to Paul. And Paul's gonna share his story. It, it, was, it was Jesus Christ that appeared to Paul. Hey, this, this is actually pretty incredible. He goes, you have heard of my, con of my, my conversation, his life in, in the past, in the Jews' religion, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and I profited in the Jews' origin above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of the Father. But what happened, man? It pleased God. It pleased God. He's going to call him and save him and do this work in his life. See, Paul had a life before he was 
Paul, the apostle, you know, New Testament author, you know, whatever, you know, you're going to put after his name. He had a reputation. He made a name for himself and they knew about it. They heard about it in what he calls the Jews religion. I think it's interesting. Two times the Holy Spirit calls it the Jews religion. And it's not in a positive connotation when Paul says this or you read about it. The law that was given to Moses, that's good. Like the law is good. I right? we think, oh man, the, but the law, the law serves a purpose. And it shows us that, that we're not good enough, that we're guilty. The sacrificial system that God put in place revealing our need for a substitutionary atonement. Man, we need someone to take our place because we can't pay the price of our own sins. And it's all pointing to the, to the Messiah that's going to come. But by the time Paul came along, it became the Jews' religion. It was a system. It was a tradition. They, you know, I, I think it's like, like how, however, it's like 500 something pages they could have written, you know, uh, the whole Torah, books of the Torah on. There's like 500 volumes, you know, when you get to like the Mishnah and the Talmud, 26 volumes. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. All these writings about, well, what did Paul mean? And, or what did Moses mean? And what's the traditions? And here's the things that they learned. And, and, and what they did, especially when, when the world became Hellenized with the Greek culture around 200 years before Jesus, they began to institute these traditions. And, and then they would also compromise with the culture and say, well, here's what Paul meant, you know, by, by or not Paul, Moses, you know, said this. And what he means by this is this. So, so you can kind of, when we can accommodate this Greek culture. We can accommodate these things right here. And some people do that away. They, oh, well, then what, then what Jesus really meant by this? You know, and you, you can kind of, you know, the culture says that's okay. God didn't really mean that here. And here's how we can explain. And they had these traditions and custom that really took the power away from the word of God to excuse their own sin. And Paul was zealous. And, and he says there he was zealous for the traditions, not for God. And he wasted the church. Acts chapter 9, if you go, that's your homework. Go read Acts chapter 9. Yeah, we got homework. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's Sunday school, right? You know, so. And you think about Paul. Remember in, in chapter 9, it says that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Right? Just ble breathing out murder and threats. And, and, and he's, he's sharing with him his story, his testimony. Not, not so that he can like, man, boy was I bad. Let me tell you how bad I was. Oh, man, I was the worst. And, you know, and, and I, there's sometimes, you know, I, I, I've been around the church long enough and you hear people share their story and their testimony. And it's like, you're thinking, man, they, man their life was pretty, that was pretty awesome, you know. And like, and then I found Jesus. You know, and it's like, like the highlight was their life before, you know. Paul's not sharing this to say, man, my life was, was you know, something great. I think sometimes people forget. It's like, yeah, okay, I did this or was that. And they forget to kind of include the parts like, and I was empty and I was lonely and I was afraid and living in the fear of death and there was no peace in my life. And I was weighed down by guilt and shame. That's the truth. That's the reality of our past. But Paul, Paul he's not trying to oppress people like, man, there I was, you know. And, and sometimes I think we think, oh, man, well, my story's not Paul's story. I'm not the, you know, and you'll hear, you know, and there I was. And the needles were in my arm and I was dead. And I saw a light from heaven. And you're like, wow, man, that guy, God really loved that guy. And, and you know what? And praise the Lord that God does that. Praise the Lord God saves people from any different place. But you know, your story is just as powerful if you grew up in the church and you came to church week after week and you were the quote unquote good person, right? You were just there at church. You followed the rules. You did it all right. Like, like Paul, you say, man, on the outside, it was, it was blameless before men. And yet, there you were in, in your Sunday school class or maybe you were in a Bible study and whatever time in your life and, and you realize, man, I've, I've got religion and I've got all these good works and all these things, but, but my heart is still wicked and you're a sinner. And, 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 and as Jesus was calling you by his grace, you responded to that call and you came to Christ. That's powerful. Because you know what? There's a lot of people that think they're good people, but you know what? There's none good. We're not good enough. 
that test, people need to hear the testimony that, man, I thought I was a good person and I thought my life was together, but you know what? I still needed Jesus Christ, right? And the point, the point Paul is making here, what he's talking about is the transformation in his life because of the gospel of his grace. That's Paul's story. He knew works. He knew religion. He knew the law. These guys are coming from that. That's what they're bringing. Hey, we're in this and we've got that. And Paul's saying, listen, that was my story too. Man, I was, I was like the chief of all of that. Man, I was the Pharisee. I was the, you know, re, re, I, I was persecuting and wasting the church. I had, I had the law. I know what the law brings. I know the bondage that it is. But I needed grace. And he says, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace. You know, Paul's looking back at his life. You, you think about that? When you, if you're saved, you ever have those moments where you look back and you, you just think, God, you... Like, you had a plan before I even, I even knew you. Before I was thinking, man, I really, you ever have that moment? You had that moment, man, I really need God. I got to get my life together. Maybe that's part of your story, right? And then you, you come to the Lord and you look back and you realize, man, God, God was after me here. I wasn't even looking for him. I didn't even care about him. You know, God, God, here, God, you, you look and you, God, he sees this. He called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might, what, preach him among the heathen. And immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Or I didn't go up to Jerusalem to, to those which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And, you know, Paul, it, it's grace. You know, Paul, what Paul's saying here is that, you know, Paul didn't need some special service in Jerusalem. He didn't need an apostle to be like, you know, here, Paul, now you're saved. Paul didn't get saved from an apostle or a person. It, it wasn't necessary. You know, Paul... You, you look at Paul's life, right? Paul, Paul was, the Holy Spirit was doing a great job, right? Isn't this so wonderful? See, Paul was there being a Pharisee, casting his vote against uh, Stephen, as we see there in the book of Acts in chapter seven and eight, and we look at what's happening there in the context of things, no doubt a part of the Sanhedrin, I mean, the religious elite, the scholars of the day, I mean, Paul, Paul had all of those things. Paul was there and he heard that message. He was standing, consenting unto his death. And he saw the grace, he saw the love, and he was fighting it. And the word of God is living and powerful and the Holy Spirit was doing the job on his end. And when Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, he says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And we say, I had never heard anybody talk like that before. What does that mean? Well, a goad, you would... You know, you have a stubborn animal like an ox that you're trying to move and it says, I don't want to move, I don't want to go. And you, you goad it. You hit it with a sharp pointy stick in the backside. And so it, and if it's, you know, a smart animal, like the animal is, you know, going to be smart enough to go, oh, I don't want to get poked by this and it's going to move, right? But to kick against it, that's just, that's one stubborn beast right there, you know? I say, and Paul, man, this is hard. Why, why are you kicking? Why are you fighting so hard? You're fighting me. Paul was fighting Jesus. He's persecuting the church, but he's like, you're persecuting me. This is, this is so, so hard. This, this life that, that you have, what, what you're doing, Paul. Fighting against it. And yet he says, there I was. That was my life. That's where I was at. And yet it pleased God. I'm fighting Jesus. I'm persecuting his church. I'm making people blaspheme and, and all of these things. I'm breathing murder and yet it pleased God. And, and, and the greater point there, you know, it's kind of, you get these nuggets in between. It, it, it pleased God and then you get this. He separated me. He called me by grace. But it, what pleased God in verse 16, it picks up the thought. It pleased God to reveal his son in me. You know, here's how he did it. But that's what God, he wanted to reveal his son in me. He wanted me to, in me. Not, not just to me, but in me. I think it's, it's amazing here. He wanted to do this and he, and he, he realizes is, is he's, I've been fighting Jesus. I was so undeserving and yet God loved me and he wanted, he wanted to save me and to reveal his son in me, in my life. In my life. And I think about that. You know, here Paul, it, and, and you, might, you might feel the same way because we look at that right here and you think, man, there's no way God could love me. There is no way God could forgive me. You think about maybe what you've done or where you've been or our past or our story. And listen, we've all got different stories. You know, we, sometimes we come to church and we're like, man, look at all those goody two-shoes here. Like, just get to know some of them, man, you know. And you'll find out, you know, our stories too. 
be like, I don't know if I should sit by them. Don't worry, they've been transformed, you know? Like, don't talk about your husband or wife that way. <laughs> but we think, I don't deserve this. I, don't, I, I, I can't, I, I can't. listen, that's the point. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. If you think you deserve it, you got it all wrong. It's not about, man, boy, you know, I've done this stuff. No, 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 you've done nothing. You provide the sin. You are the sinner. He's the savior. No one deserves it. He says, it, 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 grace is getting what we don't deserve. We're forgiven. Man, we're set free from the power of sin. We're given a new life. Paul says, I've been given a new life, a new purpose. He revealed his son in me so I could what? I, I could preach among the heathen, right? I, I could share this message. I could go preach. The, what, I, what an ironic pl plot twist for the life of Paul too. I mean, you look about that here, that God sends this Hebrew of Hebrews to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. It, 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 the, in that time, in that culture, in that time, the devout Jews hated the Gentiles. They actually said, you can look at their writings, that, that they considered the Jews or the Gentiles fuel for the fire of hell. Man, that's just really loving right there. That's the heart of God, if I ever heard it. No, it's not. And so what does God do? He takes this guy that grew up his whole life hating the Gentiles. They wouldn't even be near them and touch them and encounter them, and he sends them to the Gentiles. And I think that's funny because we would, we would maybe look at Paul and say, you know, let's do, a, let's do a strengths and needs analysis in Paul's life. And, you know, what are his, you know, what has he really got going for him? You know, what are, let's, let's survey his skills and his abilities. And, you know, where does he land? What kind of enneagram is he? You know, and, and like, I don't even know. All these things people come up with now, whatever the new test is, right? And it's like we would look at Paul and say, you know what his strength is? His strength is the Jews, like, that's where he came from. He knows it. He's the scholar. And even Paul, he felt that way. Like, man, man I, 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 can really, I can really reach these people. And we might think, like, send them to the Gentiles. What a waste of talent. I mean, would he be a better fit reaching the Jews? But don't you love that God's plans and God's ways are so above our ways? And God had something far greater for the life of Paul. You know, it, it, you know and, and I think sometimes we, oh, you know, my strength, and my gift and, and my ability and, and God, you can use me here and you can do this in my, and we, we analyze things in that way. And, and I think so often what God does on purpose is he takes our weakness. God, I don't even like those people. Oh man, don't worry. I'm gonna do something so great in your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this love in your heart for these people that, that you, you hate. I remember my, my Sunday school teacher growing up, he became a missionary in the Philippines and, and, and he was a Marine and he hated uh, the, the Filipinos from when he was in the Marines and over there. And, and, and yet here he goes over on a short-term mission trip and, and, and he's now saved and born again and God changes his heart. And he's been there for over 30 years serving the Lord faithfully. You know, and and you're, gonna, you're gonna be buried over there. What, what a testimony of the grace of God transforming a heart. You think, wow, I, no way. And that, that's where God sends him. And, you know, God, God does that. And, and he does these things so that he gets greater glory. He gives him this love for the Gentiles. And I think when we yield our plans and our purposes to the heart of God, he opens up a door for our lives to be a powerful testimony of his grace. So Paul, he didn't confer with flesh and blood, he says there in verse 16. He didn't go up to Jerusalem in verse 17 to the apostles that were before him. He went to Arabia, returned to Damascus. And after three years, he went to Jerusalem to see Peter. He abode with him 15 days. The other apostles, he saw none except James, the Lord's brother. And now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I, I lie not. You know, and you think, why, why is Paul telling all of this? Well, how does this fit into kind of the, the, the context of these things right here? Well, they're, they're attacking Paul. They're attacking his credentials, his ministry, his message, all of these things. And Paul, he, he's not a real apostle. He's not legit. And I think what Paul is trying to say here is, I wasn't trying to be an apostle. It's not like I went down and was like, all right, you know, I need to get approval from these guys down here. And, and I got saved. And immediately I was like, you know, I just, I'm just, 
you know, going to post my resume on apostle.com and, uh, you know, I'm just going to put it out there like, hey, guys, you know, like I really got, I, this is, I think I could be a great fit here. I hear you got an opening, that Judas guy, you know, that didn't really work out so well. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe I could kind of come down there. And he said, I didn't, he didn't go down to Jerusalem. Like, I got to mix it up. I got to connect, man, with Pete and, you know, Jimbo down there. And that's James, Jimbo, right? No, and he, I, I got I to gotta get it together with these guys and like, God, hey, you know, name drop. Yeah, you know, I was on the, on the road and, you know, Jesus, you know, you know, Jesus, yeah, he appeared right to me. Wow, you know, like, wow, and this guy, and we could use him. That wasn't, he, he didn't do that. He got saved. Jesus appeared to him, revealed this, this gospel of grace to him. He just begins sharing the gospel boldly in a powerful way. And you read about it in chapter 9. And then he says, he, he, you know, there was persecution. He, he, he goes into the desert in Arabia. He comes back into Damascus. He spends three years. We, we don't really know everything that happened in Paul's life in that three-year period. But, you know, we, we think, what's God doing? I think, I think there's a lot of soul searching. I think there's a lot of meditation on the scriptures. A lot of repenting, a lot of tears, a lot of growth in his life as he's just processing through all these things that he knew in his life before and here, you know, just, just probably a lot of worship. Wow, God, you're so amazing. God, he's just spending time at the feet of Jesus, growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and they're not wasted years. We think, no, we got to get Paul out there. No, they're not lost years in Paul's life. They're essential years. You know, you look at the great men of God in the Bible that, that God used in incredible ways as there was often desert years in their life. Moses, he spent 40 years in the desert. <laughs> that 40 years, he thought he was something. 40 years learning he was nothing. And then he spent 40 years seeing God do something with a nothing. And you look at David. I mean, David's anointed. Maybe he's 15 years old, you know, 17 years old. He's a young man. By the time he takes the throne, it could be 15 years later in his life. You know, 17 years, depending on, you know, you, you look at the dates and try to figure it out. And, and there he spent some of those years around a king that was throwing spears at him. And he's learning how not to be a king. He spends years in the desert on the run, hiding out. God's, 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 God's shaping him. And I love it in, 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 when you read through Samuel when, when David comes to his lowest point in Adullam there, that, that what happened is all the people that were destitute, <laughs> that were just, you know, down and out, you know, all, all these people that, you know, were just so frustrated with what was happening, they all came to David. <laughs> and it says he became a captain over them. God did something in David's life in the desert to make him the man that God wanted him to be. And, and, and that's okay. And there's seasons in our life, you know, of, of, of obscurity, you know, where, where, where it's good to, to be alone with the Lord. It's good to let the Lord mold us and shape us. And then after three years, in verse 18, he goes up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And he abode with him 15 days. But the other apostles, they saw none except James, the Lord's brother. And now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I don't lie. And afterwards, I, I came into the regions of, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, oh, I lost my place. I came into the regions of Syria, uh, Cilicia, and, and I was unknown by face to the churches in Judea, which were in Christ, but they have heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which he once destroyed, and they glorified God in me. So, so he goes up there to Jerusalem to see Peter, and the idea of that to see Peter is just to, to get to know him, to build a relationship. You know, and, and what the, the point that Paul's making in this is that, that he was saved by grace. There weren't any apostles involved with it. Then he goes, and after three years, he's been preaching, He's been reasoning through the scriptures and God's been moving in Damascus and he has to run for his life from there because, the, you know, the, the Jews want to kill him. He goes down to Jerusalem, talks with those guys. They know Paul's story. They hear about what God's doing in his life and they're, they're not opposed to it. They're not like, no, Paul, man, you got this message all wrong. Right? They're, 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 they're unified in that. And Paul, Paul's making that point because he's, he's saying what this gospel is. And, you know, and here, you know, the, the interesting thing, you read through this, you know, not everybody was so welcoming of Paul. He, he was unknown by face of the churches in Judea, which were in Christ. And when we read through it in Acts, is not everybody was so welcoming of Paul. It was, it was like, is this too good to be true? Is he, like, you know, going to be a double agent? And he's just trying to, like, get in and find out all these details, and then he's going to really let us have it? 
You know, because his past was so bad. You know, he, he, you know it, it took time for people to see the change in his life. And, and I think about that because all of that damage and hurt and pain that he caused, you know, th- that, that impacted those people. But yet the truth and the reality is, is that when Paul came to Jesus Christ, the old things passed away and all things became new. He was a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, and, 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 and yet that's his reality. But here he comes to the church and, and they're having a hard time with that. They're having a hard time with the grace of God. And, and I point that out because you know what? If you look at Paul's life, that didn't stop Paul from living for Jesus. You know, people might look at your life and they can look at your past and maybe you hurt them and it was real. You caused them pain and heartache because of the way that you lived and your sin and on all these things. And, 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 and it's almost too good to be, oh, oh, so you just come to Jesus and everything's okay right now. And, and, and you're, you're like, listen, you know, I, it, it's, this is different. And I, I've been saved and, and okay, okay. And maybe they don't believe it. And that's on them. But you keep living for Jesus. You keep going after the Lord. Even if it's church people. That's church people here, right? And in time, they see it. You walk in love. And then God will open up doors for reconciliation. God, Paul, Paul's heart. You know, Paul, Paul, I think Paul, the reason he, I mean, you think about how Paul was the one that wanted to bring those gifts back to help the people in Jerusalem. Why? Because Paul was the one that wasted those people so much before. And he just wanted to show them. He wanted them to know that this is real. And that was his heart. And he went after that. And they're going to see the power. And they do. Look at, you know, they, they, they hear, right? They, they hear in verse 22 uh, that, that he that persecuted the church in times past, he now preached the faith with he once destroyed. And what do they do? Man, they begin to glorify God in him. And what grace does, what grace does, it brings glory to God. It brings glory to God. They knew his life before. It, it, he persecuted us. It was personal for them. When they heard about the transformation, they saw what grace had done in Paul's life. They glorified God in Paul's life. And I think that's a wonderful thing because the grace of God, it changes lives. The grace of God produces a testimony like this. And, and I guess my question today is, has the grace of God changed your life? Has it changed your life? I, I was thinking about this. Uh, it, it's been coming up uh, very soon, 30 years uh, since I came to know the Lord and my life was impacted by the grace of God. And, and I remember w- one of the things that God did in my life to bring me to him. I, I grew up, I was the kid that grew up in church. I went, to, I went to church more than most people before I was five years old and some people go to in their lifetime, man. I was drugged as a kid, drugged to church on Sundays, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or it was Thursday night, you know, Saturday night. Pre- I mean, we had, we had, there, there was a whole lot going on there. You know, it was, it was all the time. And I, I knew, knew the stories and all of those things right there. And I remember sitting in the living room. We would often have people over at our house. And there we were. And people were just sharing this night about how they came to know the Lord and telling their story. And like, oh, man, you know, here, you know here's this. And I came to know the Lord. And just, just talking about how they, and I love, you know, and to, to this day, I love hearing about when it's like, hey, how'd you come to Jesus? And like, because everybody's story is just so amazing. Like, you know, and it, it's just so great to hear like how God saved us and what God's done. And, and I remember sitting there and listening to all that and hearing all that and realizing I, I don't have that. Like, I, I know, like, I know church and I know, you know, and it wasn't like some horrible, it was just, but I, I knew I, I needed that. So I got, God, God called me and separated me from my mother's room and he wanted, womb and he wanted to, to, to reveal his grace in me, not just to me, but in me. And it needed to be in my life. And I needed, I needed that. And I, and I remember struggling with that. I remember like, I remember this like, uh, and, and it just kind of like, it just impacted me. Like, like, like this isn't my own. And we went to church that next morning. And we went early uh, to, the, to the early service uh, because it was actually my birthday. And we were having a, a birthday party because that's what you do, you know, when it's your birthday. You know, you should. It's, it's fun to celebrate. You know, party all week long. I don't care, you know, especially on my birthday. But, you know, like, like so, so we went. And I remember that, that the, 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 the gospel was shared. An invitation was given. <laughs> Everybody, you know, bow your heads, raise your hand there. And, and, and I remember this, like, this, this pull in my heart that I need to do. I need to give my life to Jesus right now. And, 
and I didn't do it. I was like, but I can't. But I, my dad's a pastor. And I grew up in the church and what are people going to think? And, and, and I'm struggling with all this and I, I just, I can't. And it's just eating at me and eating at me. We get in the van, me and I'm there. I'm talking, sharing this with my mom and dad and we're driving down the freeway and I, I couldn't Google earth the exact location I was when, when, when I got saved. Because I remember we parked the van and we're sitting in the driveway and I remember just my dad and, and mom there. Well, let's do that right now. And I got saved. I got baptized. I got a picture. Somebody, somebody randomly stabbed a picture at Pirate's Cove. You saw the Pirate's Cove up there, like getting baptized. And I just walked out. I got to do this. We were there. Got baptized. Came to know Jesus Christ. You know, and, there, and I think of like how, how, how his grace has impacted my life. You know, and, 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 and I look back and Lord, it pleased you to call me. It pleased you to reveal your son in me. And you did that then and you're still, I mean, and his grace, is, it's, it blows us away day by day and year by year. You, and you think, this is so incredible. And the reason I share that is maybe you need to respond to that invitation today. You need a story of grace. You don't want a story of church. You need a story of Jesus Christ. And if you've never come to Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. When we close and we pray and we're gonna worship the Lord, you come up here, you get out of your seat, and you come and pray with us. And, and, and we want to give you a Bible. We want to talk with you. We want, we want you to know Jesus. Not just church and religion. We're about Jesus. If you're online, somebody is online right now. They will type with you and be like, I need Jesus. And, you, and they will pray with you and connect with you and get you a Bible. All right? We want you to know the Lord, that you could know the grace of God in your own life. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work and the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Lord, convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment. And Lord, we thank for that wrestling in our hearts. Like Paul, he had that struggle and it was hard. And somebody right now might be having that struggle and, oh, I don't know. And, and I better hear. And, and what's my wife going to think? Or what's whoever, who cares what anybody thinks? Lord, we're not living to please man but you. And what matters are we right with you? And if we're not right with you and somebody needs to come to Jesus today, that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, if, if our hearts are just in a place where, Lord, we, we've lost the, the sense of awe and the wonder of what you've done, Lord, that we would be reminded of your grace today. And Lord, we would respond to it afresh, Lord, to let your grace impact our life and never lose, Lord, the wonder of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand. Let's